Okay, so now we'll talk about uh, the long-term management of uh, IHD. Um, so the first question is, how long uh, antiplatelets should we be giving for patients with IHD? Or rather following an ACS? Um, so basically, I think for ACS patients, then we should give one year, mm. uh, regardless of whether they have a stent or not, because that's based on the estimation. For patients with stable ischemic heart disease, then obviously it depends on whether they get a stent, right? Because if you don't have a stent, you just need aspirin. If they get a stent, then um, at least six, usually at least six months of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. Yeah. With regards to the beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, uh, we just want to check with you like when do we start it and is there a specific agent uh, that is better than others? Right. Okay. So so let's start with beta blockers first. So I think I mentioned in, in um, initial talk as well. So we should start beta blockers early in acute coronary syndrome because it helps to reduce your uh, uh, the workload of the heart. Um, with regards to if it's just purely ACS, there is no that whichever beta blocker is okay. But if you think that blood pressure is a concern, then usually I would give something short acting like metoprolol so that um, it just works for that. Um, less than 12 hours. Mm. Um, the other thing to take note of for beta blockers is obviously if a patient comes in with acute heart failure, then we usually avoid initiating uh, beta blockers. Um, I mean, if it's mild failure, like just a bit of crabs, I think that's fine. But if the patient is like on NIV and it's quite bad heart failure, you should be a bit more cautious in studying uh, beta blockers. Um, again, in patients who have let EF that's less than 40%, then that's definitely a very good indication to start a beta blocker. And for this, we do have specific beta blockers that we use, like um, Carbidilol and Bisoprolol. The guidelines also suggest, uh, I also say that you can use this metoprolol succinate, but I think that's the one um, that is different from what we have in NH and Singapore, and I, and I think all over Singapore. So I think we all have metoprolol arginate or something, which, which is not the recommended one. And if the EF is low, then we always try to push them up to the maximum dose. Uh, the higher, the better. Lah. So that's why you, you always bring them back to the heart failure pharmacy clinic to try and, uh, to try and up titrate these medications. Okay. Um, if a patient has stable ischemic heart disease and you are using the beta blocker for its anti and general effect, then most of us try to lower the heart rate. Um, you can try to target less than 60, but obviously if the patient you started by superlow 2.5 and the patient's angina is gone and the heart rate is like 70, then you don't have to aggressively lower it. But it's more of in terms of if the patient still has angina, you can you can you can actively try and lower it until it's less than 60. Lah. Because obviously you can't go lower than 60. Uh, then for ACE and ARB, um, I would say that the evidence is actually more for patients who have low EF. Um, Again, the cutoff is about 40%. And in the guidelines, it's generally accepted that it's a class benefit. So the reason why, why there is this differentiation between beta blockers and ACE is because for beta blockers, when they did trials on the, the various beta blockers, not every beta blocker had benefits. Mm. I can't remember which one was the one that failed, but there was one beta blocker that, that didn't quite succeed. Lah. But in general, for ACE and ARB, they all showed that there was benefit. And again, if the EF is low, then we try to push the ACE and ARB higher. Mm. Um, some people might try to avoid using certain ACE and ARBs that have not been studied in trials. I think that is quite a big topic by itself, and I can't remember all of them. But offhand, things like, for example, tell me Satan, Omi Satan, I don't think they have much evidence in cardiovascular patients. So I think it's, it's probably good to just stick to the common ones that you always see, like Dosatan, Balsatan, uh, Inalapril, Lisinopril. You won't go wrong with using the more common ones. Um, and as I mentioned just now, um, for ACE and ARB, I think the evidence is stronger if the EF is low. If your EF is normal, then if you have diabetes, if you have hypertension, if you have CKD, the reason why I put a question mark on CKD is because a lot of us actually are quite hesitant to start patients with CKD or ACE or ARB. But if you do have these factors, then again, that is more reason to start at ACE or ARB. Okay. Yeah, thank Just you. to clarify, so when you say start early in ACS, right? So for the beta blockers, would it be mm -hmm. at the same setting as when they come in when we look like the DAPT, then we give them yeah. beta blockers also? 
Yeah, because remember that when these patients come in, they only get a PC, they're going to get a PCI hours later. Yeah. So I usually try to to rest them, lower the heart rate down, so that they don't get recurrent chest pains at events while waiting for their care flight. So the nurses won't call you the uh, patient got chest pain. So you do what you can to reduce their ischemic burden. So in the ED setting, do we also give them beta blockers when they come in for those like P1 cases with uh, STEMIs and stuff? Uh, yeah, usually if the ED calls me, I usually ask them to start it. Mm, the next question is whether or not there's a role for low-dose anticoagulation. So I understand that there are some emerging studies that uh, suggest that a low-dose like rivaroxaban alongside antiplatelets may have some benefits in some patients. Is this something that we practice? So we don't practice it for a very important reason that we don't have uh, rivaroxaban 2.5 BD. Oh, okay. So that's the first, yeah, so that's the first thing. I think the second thing is, so for cardiology, we have a lot of trials. I mean, I guess that's one of the things that makes cardiology exciting, but that's also kind of a downer because it's very hard to put together all the trials. So, so I think in the COMPASS trial for patients with, um, who, are at, who are higher risk of getting cardiovascular events, it shows that if you put them on Rivaroxaban 2.5 BD, it lowers their risk mm. at a risk of increased bleeding. Okay. And I can tell you that there's a lot of other stuff that has been studied before that reduces your cardiovascular risk, but will always increase your bleeding risk. It's always, it's always risk versus benefit, right? So you can put them on clopidogrel for, um, for one year, and then it also reduces your, your, your ischemic risk, but increase your bleeding risk, Ticagol as well. So I think for me, in a local setting, we are usually always more comfortable with uh, minimizing bleeding risk. Mm. There's always this Asian paradox where they say that Asians are more prone to bleeding. Yeah. Uh, there's some observational data to suggest that. So I wouldn't suggest to, to put patients on this unless, unless they are young and they truly have very high, they have proven themselves that they have recurrent MIs, they are very high ischemic burden, then I might put them on this. But we don't have this 2.5 BD, la, so don't have to think so much. Oh, yeah, so what do we look out for for patients when we follow them in clinic? So, so I think when you see patients in the clinic, um, I'm assuming that they're post-MI, post-PCIs and things like that. So one of the important things to, to look through the CAF is see whether they have any residual disease. La. So residual disease, I think the a safe cutoff would say would be 50%. If you think, if you see the angiogram showing that there's still 50%, stenosis in some artery that's not open up, then just be mindful um, um, whether that needs further evaluation. Most of us would put it in the plans, but in case in case it's not, uh, someone forgot to uh, and you see it, then you must you must ask the senior, like, is there a need to reassess with a stress test? Um, again, 50% also applies to major epicardial vessels, so like RCA, circumflex, things like that. If, if you're going to put there, D3, 50%, then that's probably not going to be important. Mm. So whether any residual disease. I think the second bit is um, a lot of times post-MI, they have uh, dropped in EF. So if you have a patient who has an EF of 30 to 35% and below, then it's an important thing to repeat, to, to reassess their EF month data because it, it actually affects the decision whether they need to put in ICD, right? Mm. Um, to prevent for primary prevention of uh, uh, um, cardiac arrhythmias and death. But if, a page, but the EF, if the EF is like 40, 45%, it doesn't really make a difference because you wouldn't expect it to drop. So mm -hmm. even if you repeat 40 or 45, it doesn't change management. So I, I will say that if the cutoff is about 30 to 35 and below, then you, have, you should repeat the um, echo, usually about three to four months time now. Yeah. Um, Always important to speak to the patient about DABT compliance duration, make sure they are taking it, make sure they have no bleeding uh, problems with the medications. Uh, in terms of targets, um, again, there's many different targets that uh, different guidelines use. Mm. I would say, uh, so I think for the Europeans, they use 1.4 and Americans, they use 1.8. But to note for the Americans, they actually advocate to start on high dose of statins and their target is more of if even after starting is not less than 1.8, then you should consider adding stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so is, is, um, I think if you see a patient whose LDL is still kind of high, like more than two, then um, you should try to 
be more aggressive in terms of lowering, lowering the LDL, regardless of whichever guidelines, right? So two and above would probably be too high. Uh, for blood pressure targets, make sure it's less than 140. Um, I think most of us know, know about the sprint trial, we, where, where the target is 120, but that, that might be a bit too aggressive. Uh, so less than 140, I think it's quite a good target to keep to. The other thing to note is a lot of patients have white coat hypertension. I tend not to treat whatever blood pressure I see in a clinic. Mm. I usually always attribute it to white coat. And I always advise every patient to buy their own uh, BP cuff uh, machine to measure their blood pressure at home and to bring it... Um, during their next clinic visit. And this is actually in the guidelines as well that we should avoid using um, clinic blood pressure. We should avoid treating clinic uh, blood pressure targets. Um, for HbA1c, poorly controlled diabetes and uh, macrovascular disease doesn't correlate that well. But I think in general, um, it's always good to, to, to keep a target of less than seven. Um, and bearing in mind the, the, the diabetic medications that have uh, better cardiovascular outcomes are metformin and SGLT2 inhibitors. So if you need to put anyone on any diabetic medicines, it should be these two. Uh, yeah. um, and I think the last thing is, of course, assessing the patient, whether they still have any uh, residual angina. Um, job, is, job is always important because we have a lot of uh, vocational drivers. And after they get PCI, after they get acute chronic syndrome, it's important that they shouldn't be driving. and uh, I would say all of them actually need a stress test um, after, their chronic, uh, after their event, before they're allowed to drive. So make sure you document, document that you have advised the patient to stop driving. Uh. Whether they follow is, yeah, you're not the police, you can't, you can't stop them, but you should, you should advise them that, it's, um, that they shouldn't be driving during this period of time. Okay, thank you. The next question is um, about uh, how do we assess for procedural fitness in patients uh, with known IHD? I think the first important thing is assessing procedural fitness actually really depends on whether the surgery is emergent uh, slash urgent or elective. Mm. Because a lot of times pre-op workout is actually for elective patients. It's not for emergent or urgent um, yeah. surgical indications. I mean, if a patient needs to go for BK for diabetic food that has become infected, then he has to go for it regardless of his risk. Mm -hmm. If the surgery is emergent or urgent, usually what we say is proceed with surgery, but it's at high cardiovascular risk because we assume everyone has high cardiovascular risk. So if it's uh, elective surgery, then the next thing that we do is we assess the risk. Uh, most of us use um, this thing called the revised knee index. Um, it's available on your MAC calculator. Uh, it's very easy, very easy to, to look through. Um, and then you just key in all these things and you just see what the risk is and advise the patient. Um, if, if the risk is low, then of course they can just proceed uh, for surgery. If the risk is moderate to high, then um, we then turn to the patient and assess his uh, functional status. Mm. I would say if a patient can climb more than two flights of stairs, then most of the time, most of us are quite comfortable with saying that you can proceed with surgery. Mm. Yeah, some people say one flight is, is also okay. So just stick to two, maybe two flights of stairs. If you can climb two flights of stairs, you should be able to undergo an operation with, without much problems. Okay. Uh, then if the patient can't do stairs, the patient is bed bound, the revising index that shows is moderate high risk, then, then you consider a stress test. But you have to think about um, what the stress test is going to do because a lot of times, even if the stress test comes with positive, whether you want to offer angioplasty to a patient is, is, is another topic. But basically, pre-operative revascularization has never been shown to reduce your cardiovascular uh, uh, outcomes. So whether you want to offer PCI is, is, is another huge, is another big thing that you go through with the patient. So, so that's why I say consider stress test and not just routinely offer everyone a stress test. Okay, got it. So the next question we're going to ask is like basically in line with all these procedures, uh, most of our patients who are IHD, they are sort of anti uh, some of them are DAPT size uh, on SAPT. And I think a lot of times we are caught between uh, stopping it for the procedure and the risk of uh, you know, the stents and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we're just wondering when would it be safe to hold off uh, anti pellets or how do we go about it? So this is from um, the American guidelines. So the 
the take home message is if the surgery is elective, then usually we try to give uh, at least six months of the DAPT before the patient goes for um, surgery. But of course, if the patient is going for something that is emergent or urgent, then, um, then we might have to reduce that duration. Uh, the, the ESC guidelines, the next slide. Yes, so the ESC guidelines, they are a bit more garang. Uh, they say just one month. Uh, so even if it's elective procedure, it's okay to stop it after one month. So I think the, the take home message is with most contemporary stents, it's actually okay to stop um, your antipilates at one month. So these are trials done for various uh, brands of stents. They're all common stents. Uh, and all of them study one month of dual antipilate therapy and it's actually safe to, to stop it at one month. Um, so I would say if a patient is undergoing procedure, first it depends on whether it's urgent or not. So obviously if it's urgent, urgent, like the patient's bleeding, and even if the, the stand was put in one, two weeks ago, then there's no option, you have, you have to stop it. Okay. But if the patient is going, for example, like a cancer surgery, which you can kind of wait, but it's not urgent, then usually one month is, is with most contemporary stands, we are quite okay to stop it at one month. Mm. If the surgery is truly elective, then I think most of us will still try to go for six months. But for stable patients, they don't have stents, so um, it's just a single antiplatelet. And, and most of us would say, uh, okay, so for stable patients, if you have stent many years ago, then we will usually still say, try to keep on your single antiplatelet. Mm. If a stable patient has never had a stent, then we would discuss with the surgeon, because obviously if you stop aspirin, there's higher risk of uh, MIs during the procedure, but if we don't stop the aspirin, they might bleed more. So it's kind of a discussion. Lah. But obviously, if they don't have a stand, then we are more okay to stop the antipilot. The one common thing that we always get is dental procedures. Mm. So dental procedures is, actually the general advice is to continue unless it's like the patient is taking out 20 teeth or something, then they obviously don't stop. But if it's just a simple procedure, actually they should continue on their antipilot because we get that... Um, uh, question a lot from the dentist. Okay. Yeah. Um, before we move on to the take-home points, I have one last question about NT and gynos. Um, so let's say patients uh, already started the already started beta blockers and still has ongoing angino symptoms. Um, how do you, what are the options for NT and gynos, and how do you decide um, between these agents subsequently? Okay, so upfront, uh, uh, nitrates will probably be something that we use quite commonly. Mm. Um, calcium general blockers um, is also recommended, but for some reason in NUH, we don't use it too often, but it's actually in the guidelines, so we can add nifedipine and things like that for angina. Um, then it comes to your lesser use agents like ivabradine, which um, is a funny channel inhibitor, it lowers your heart rate. Mm. So sometimes if you already max out beta blockers, the patient's heart rate is already a bit low, may not be useful. Um, I have uh, I just came back from uh, HNDP, right? So actually, we use a lot of analysis in the UK. Actually, it works quite well as well. But I think it's quite expensive in Singapore. So that's quite, quite a, um, it might be difficult to, to initiate that. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think that's about. For nitrates, is there a difference between uh, your ISMN and ISDN for anti angina purposes? Yeah, I tend to prefer ISMN because it's once a day. ISDN is quite problematic. But again, if like, the earlier point I mentioned, if blood pressure is a concern, then usually we just give like small doses of ISD and kind of um, to minimize the hypotensive effect. Okay. And what about trimetazidine? I think some people can, as in I've seen that being given also. Yeah. I Personally, I think it's more like a vitamin. So I, I, I try not to. I don't think it's very well. I mean, the evidence why it's not strong. But I mean, if a patient has persistent angina who has nothing to lose, Mm. Then it's worth giving it, but uh, Bacterial is three times a day, so it's also quite, I mean, adding pill burden to the patient. Uh. Sure, okay. So take home first line, try to optimize the beta blockers, then nitrate, mm. the calcium channel blockers can be considered also. Uh. Yeah, and then the lesser known agents. Uh, of course, if everyone, everything fails, then refer to the interventional cardiologist to see what we can do. Uh. Okay, can. Uh, okay, so uh, what take-home points do you have in terms of uh, more long-term management? 
uh, for IHD. So I think for, for patients with IHD, it's really just managing their cardiovascular risk profile. They are always going to be at risk of getting events again. Um, I always try to reassure patients that um, they may, they, I mean, it's something that you can't expect. Right? Because a lot, I think one of the things is patients always expect to come back to the clinic to see you. And sometimes in the cardio ammo clinic, it's like TCO eight months. I'm not quite sure what's the benefit of seeing there eight months' time without yeah. managing the blood pressure, heart rate, all this in the meantime. Yeah. So, so I will always emphasize that to patients. I think it's more of controlling all these factors to try and reduce their risk of getting events again in the future. Okay. Thank you.